ladies and gentlemen, welcome the moderator of the next session, Eileen Shivo. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to you all and to our uh, audience online uh, or here in Bratislava. My name is Eileen Shivo. I'm a senior policy analyst at the Center for Data Innovation. Uh, and it's an honor to, uh, to be here today to get a chance to moderate this panel for the next hour on the topic digital sovereignty and the scramble for data supremacy. I will first introduce our guests before we dive into the conversation uh, and as we'll be planning some time for questions and answers. Um, you should feel free to, uh, to, to post your questions. You can do so in several ways. Well, first you can actually raise a hand in this room and then walk to the microphone over there. Or you can log in the forum's virtual platform by typing your question on live.globsec.org or you can connect into the virtual studio uh, via Zoom. The event is being streamed uh, via Facebook Live, so feel free to share the stream on social media and engage on Twitter using the hashtag of Globsec, um, and, which is Globsec2020 and Globsec's Twitter handle. Let's give this, um, uh, this, this session a little bit of context per first to start with. So data sovereignty and data ownership uh, have become part of this so-called digital sovereignty equation that's become a strong uh, political narrative uh, among you know, European policymakers in Brussels and in member states. Um, and there are concerns over the use of personal uh, data by privacy, by private companies driving this, which um, is raising questions about who owns that data and what consumers can do with it. At the same time, data is increasingly uh, being viewed as a resource for states uh, seeking an economic and strategic advantage uh, over their rivals. Commissioner Thierry Breton, German Chancellor and Angela Merkel and others have asserted multiple times that it is time for Europe to wrestle control of European data from US and Asian counterparts, especially industrial data, uh, as you know, Europe would have lost the battle of personal data. And so Europe wants to become a worldwide data hub um, uh, and there are calls for more safeguards against uh, foreign access uh, to European data. And the idea is we need to control the data by processing it and storing it in Europe to regulate it and preserve principles like data protection and privacy. Uh, and you hear, you know, European policymakers uh, like uh, the German minister Peter Altmaier, who's spearheading Gaia X, um, showcasing it as a way to counterbalance what he views as the strategic and economic advantages derived from foreign companies owning the most considerable portion of cloud services in the world. Now, some questions for today. Um, as data enters the great power uh, competition domain, how can we balance the region's economic and security concerns without sacrificing the free flow uh, of cross-border data channel while uh, reaffirming our commitment to free digital trade? What impact will this uh, new scramble for data have on existing trade and geoeconomic conflicts? How, if Europe gets this right, can it push for data sovereignty while encouraging and cementing a values-based approach to global cooperation without serving protectionist interests? And also, of course, are any of these plans gathering support and are they likely to fly and materialize? With me today to discuss uh, this great topic and thank you all for joining. We have um, Henri Verdier, Ambassador for Digital Affairs from the Government of the French Republic joining us uh, from Paris. Lucinda Crichton joining us from Brussels. You're the Chief Executive Officer at Vulcan, uh, Vulcan Consulting and you're also former European Minister. Carl Benedict Frey, uh, who will be joining us in a few minutes. Uh, he's the Director of Future of Work at the Oxford Martin School from Oxford. And Cameron Carey, Ann R. and Andrew H. Tisch, Distinguished Visiting Fellow uh, from the Center for Technology Innovation at the Brookings Institution in Boston. And we have here with us today, in person in Bratislava, Annette yeah. Numa, Digital Transformation Advisor, e-Estonia from Tallinn. Thank you so much for being here. Let me start with you, Ambassador Verdier. Uh, let's talk a little bit about this concept of digital sovereignty and perhaps specifically data sovereignty. How should we understand uh, the Commission's vision for this? And you know, what's the trigger behind this? And how is this strategy perceived by other European member states? Perhaps, you know, starting with France. I believe you are on mute. Uh, 
Could you please turn on your audio, Ambassador? <laughs> Merci. Yes, I did turn the audio out. Sorry. Yes, I just want to say thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the amazing topic of the debate because we can exchange a lot. And I, I will try to be very interactive, so very brief. But if you, if I may, I would put the emphasis about the fact that precisely because those questions are very important, we have to be very careful when this world of data comes into the conversation. Uh, and as you may know, I was, I'm the former chief data officer for the French government, so I know a bit how complex is it. But you did notice that with the same world, we can refer to the statistics of agricultural production, to the GPS location of us, to my medical records, to the pictures that my daughter share on Instagram, and you understand easily that it's not exactly the same thing. And again, also in the same debate, we can talk about privacy protection, algorithmic governance, economic sovereignty, or manipulation of opinion, which is not exactly the same issue. So maybe we are right to do this since all these questions exist and are interconnected, but we, are, we have to be very careful uh, of two quick shortcuts or analogies. And I would point out, if you authorize me, for example, that there is a huge difference between the data that we deliberately share with, with a company while assuming the risk that they know things about me but they propose to me uh, services and uh, massive surveillance or spying. It's two different issues. Um, I would also, and I'm, I'm answering to a question, uh, to, to say that, that some metaphors are imperfect and dangerous. And for example, a lot of people say that data is a new oil. And in fact, data is not like the oil. Da data is a non-rival good. Uh, when you use it, you don't wear it out. And you even improve it very often. And if you start to reason about the governance of data as if it were about uh, access to a rare mineral, for example, you will make some mistakes. And we we'll have to face very important issues like regulating monopolies, like abuses of a dominant position, like preserving consumer freedom and the sovereignty of the states. But it cannot be through a protectionist approach. And here we are at the point where Europe starts thinking about sovereignty and France is promoting actively a vision of sovereignty. But again, we are entering in a completely new world and uh, we need a new solution and we can use the past figure just like metaphors to, to, to think. And this digital sovereignty cannot be the old uh, protectionism, cannot be the strategic hegemony, cannot be copy, copying successful players uh, in a European approach. We have to find something new. For France, and. Um, from a lot of our European friends, but we are still discussing this together, we have to start thinking in terms of strategic autonomy. As a free citizen in free countries, we have the right to decide if we want to protect our privacy, if we want to, <coughs> to, to ask for accountability about the use of algorithms. We, we have the right to decide this. And to have this right, we need to be strong enough, creative enough, participant to the global international conversation enough uh, to, to, be, to, to, to have a chance to determine the future. And very briefly, and I'm concluding like this, the French approach within this conversation is to say that this strategic autonomy cannot be a simple decision, like every data has to be in Europe, or like let's develop a European industry of 5G or things like this. We need a complete approach with four very important items. One is security, because of course, if everyone can uh, attack your infrastructures or spy your citizen, you are not sovereign. So we have to be able to protect ourselves and to fight for an international order, stable and secure. The second is to have the power of creation. If we don't have any European startups, if we, we don't have any European unicorn, if our thinker or artist uh, don't contribute to the international conversation, we won't be sovereign. 
So we need to be a land of a creation. Um, we can use our normative power to, to share our values. And of course, the GDPR, which is now a kind of uh, international uh, uh, framework used also by India, Japan, uh, California. Uh, the GDPR is very important in terms of sharing some values and sharing some norms. And that's uh, the dirty little secret in the digital economy. If you don't innovate on free infrastructures, you are not free. Uh, you, you, we need a permissionless innovation. We need to be able to innovate uh, without the permission of big tech companies or big monopolies. And for this, we should and we will encourage uh, European industry, for example, in 5G or quantum computing or uh, artificial intelligence. And personally, I want to add that we could, we could also learn to work a bit more with uh, digital commons like OpenStreetMap, Wikipedia, free software. Because when you work with on this kind of infrastructures, uh, you don't depend on the trade policy of a foreign company. So that's an important program, and I hope that we have a very interactive exchange. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador, and thank you for highlighting this uh, international element uh, collaboration of, of the EU. You're trying to, to remain open to, to its partners, but we'll get back to that uh, in a few minutes. I'd like to turn to, um, to you, Annette, um, because you can bring in uh, the member states' perspective as well from Estonia. Um, how, how are you looking at things from there? And, uh, uh, what is the really the true leeway of the European Union in managing a coordinated approach uh, when it comes to to data? So uh, also thanks for having me here, but uh, and that's a very good question. And what we are super happy about in Estonia is that we see that for the European Commission it becomes more and more like essential topic to talk about, and especially the data management, which has been on a table for us already for the past 25 years. Yeah, you heard it correct, like almost 25 years we have been talking about such kind of things. Um, so what we see is that the European Union has completely like fundamental different uh, differences when we compare to some other states such as US or, or China especially. Um, so we are respecting the rule of law and, and all this kind of data protection regulations which is which shows that why Europe should take like another a little bit different like approach and then we are very happy to see that Europe is like developing something like this so we we'll keep an eye on that uh, fully uh, but what we see especially regarding the data management uh, from the Estonian side uh, our former president uh, Mr. Ilves uh, he said a sentence that uh, sticks on my head for a very long time. Uh, he said that we shouldn't be afraid of a big brother, but we should be afraid of a small sister. Do you know who is a small sister? No. So small sister is Google, uh, is your Facebook, it's your Twitter, all these kind of platforms that we use every single day without having any knowledge if they are collecting our information, how they are collecting our information, are they using this information for something which they do, uh, but, uh, but we can never be sure that someone, like, that someone is not looking for our conversations or whatever. But, uh, but the government side, we don't have such thing as a big brother, uh, because for the Estonian side, we have a lot of transparency. So me as a citizen of Estonia, I have the full like uh, overview which government agency has been looking for my information. So we're not manipulating with anyone information without th uh, them having to knowledge about that. So that's why we should be afraid of a small sister, not actually uh, the big brother. And, and, uh, and that's why we see a lot of uh, known European uh, companies that are violating these regulations and our privacy. So, so that's why uh, we need to start regulating these things more. And if I can ask you a follow-up question, uh, because this is uh, an important issue to address, obviously, but what are some of the challenges to, if we're talking about, you know, the EU trying to facilitate data sharing between businesses mm -hmm. as part of the, the data strategy, for instance, what are the challenges that you think those projects the EU is tabling should, should solve, should tackle? Um, first of all, I, I fully feel that the European Union is not doing enough cooperation with the private sector. 
this is what we need to improve as, as soon as possible and include every time that we make these decisions and, and when we start uh, like developing this process of data management then we need to include uh, the private sector with us and, and to discuss these things also uh, with the European companies what they should do, what we should be doing together so I, I think this is where should we start and I, I guess that's the biggest issue that we're facing these days. No, thank you very much, Annette. And I think Ambassador Verdier also referred to more or less directly to the fact that we still don't have a, a truly finished uh, digital single market, uh, and perhaps we need more uh, creation, power of creation, as you, as you very well put it. Um, let me turn to uh, Cameron Carey joining us from uh, from Boston. So we talked about this digital sovereignty narrative. This more or less what uh, Ambassador Verdier also refers to as an open strategic autonomy. Um, how, how is the United States looking at us, uh, you know, uh, playing around with such narratives and, and the proposals that, are, that the Commission uh, has been putting on the table this year? Cameron? I think we've, we've lost Cameron Carey. I think, yeah. yes, frozen. it's frozen. <laughs> well then, let me turn to Carl Benedict Frey. Carl, you've joined us from Oxford. I hope you can hear me. I can. Okay, perfect. Uh, I just wanted to then collect your reaction on the proposals of, of the European Union when it comes to, you know, trying to uh, store more data in Europe uh, because the European data was generated by Europeans, belongs to, to Europeans. And I've heard Commissioner Breton say that uh, if the Russians and the Chinese are doing it, then perhaps we should be doing it as well. So I'm not too sure about that. I think we really need to, sorry. I think there's been, yeah, at first, um, so I, I first asked a question to Cameron and then we couldn't see you and hear you. So I turned to Carl. So let me first ask Carl. Carl, you can answer the question and I'll get back to you, Cam. Right. Yes, Thanks. I think, uh, Europe has clearly taken a lead on data regulation. And I actually think that one thing that we need to do is to rethink more fundamentally how the internet works and who uh, owns and stores the data. Tim Berners-Lee is uh, working on a very interesting project at MIT called SOLID. Uh, which aims to decentralize the internet um, and rather than having companies or uh, governments storing the data that you've produced, SOLID would allow you to own and store your own data. You can decide which organizations and which apps you want to share that data with. You could potentially and decide to share your data with a data agent that negotiates uh, on your behalf with potential uses because your data uh, individually has very little value uh, but pooled with other data it has significant value. Uh, we are now uh, in a period where we've seen the labor share of income fall for three consecutive decades. We are living through a period where multi uh, national corporations uh, especially in tech, are not paying their taxes. And, and we need to rebalance that somehow. And, and giving people ownership over their own data and, and creating models uh, uh, similar to labor unions, and that could be uh, something uh, like data unions to actually gain a share of the value that is being created. And I think it's absolutely critical. Thank you so much, Carl. Uh, let me then get back to you, uh, Cameron Carey from Boston. So the, Europe, uh, the European Union is going after monopolies, is trying to, you know, they want to tax uh, companies, digital platforms, and they want to create ex ante rules as well. And they want to store the, the data uh, in Europe. So asking my question to you again, how, uh, how is the United States seeing all this? And is, is the EU right to, to see itself caught in a rivalry between China and the US? Isn't there another, another way in which it could sort of create a third um, vision? Well, and thank you. And I, I hope so. And I uh, apologize for going off there. I thought I was unmuting and I uh, uh, ended my connection. So, uh, 
I'm, I'm glad you took another questioner. So, um, you know, I do think that the, the term digital sovereignty is, is frankly an, an unfortunate term uh, because uh, it sounds an awful lot like cyber sovereignty, uh, which is the term that China use, uses. I've been to the, uh, what they call the global uh, internet summit in, in Wujian, um, uh, and, you know, which is China's platform for its vision of technology and the internet. Uh, um, and cyber sovereignty is really you know, the central theme of, of that conference. Uh, um, and I think that terminology, I think, affects how Americans uh, uh, perceive uh, the digital sovereignty uh, initiative. Um, uh, and, you know, that is certainly, you know, that it has overtones of protectionism. Uh, of you know a kind of dirigisme uh, uh, with regard to the digital economy, um, and I think you know we see that uh, debate taking place uh, within the the European Union. I think there are uh, there are voices that talk about in terms you know, very strongly in terms of you know putting keeping data uh, within the European Union. Um, and, but I think uh, there are other aspects uh, uh, that, that, you know, I, I, you know, I applaud. Um, you know, I do think that, that you know, Europe is taking the lead in terms of thinking systematically and strategically uh, about, uh, about data. Uh, I think in the United States, we're a little bit complacent uh, because of uh, our technology leadership and a you know, successful uh, system of innovation. But I, I think in the United States, we need to up our game. Um, uh, you know, I think we have established some international norms uh, uh, with respect to um, uh, controls on surveillance, frankly. Um, you know, Presidential Policy Directive 28, extending uh, you know, the rights of Americans to people everywhere, uh, I think is a, uh, a new norm. Um, and we see in the decision out of the CJEU uh, on, on Tuesday uh, that a number of member states uh, uh, are conducting surveillance uh, that is frankly much broader uh, than what the U.S. has today. Um, it's comparable to uh, you know, what was repealed um, in the USA Freedom Act in, in 2015. Um, but you know, we do not have a comprehensive uh, law on uh, privacy and data protection and data security. Um, that is something that, that we need to do. Um, and I think you know, I uh, heard uh, earlier today the foreign minister's uh, a very interesting discussion, um, which I think outlines some of the ways that we need to move in the transatlantic relationship, including with respect to uh, data, to data governance, uh, uh, to the flows of information. Um, uh, I think that you know, trying to deal with information uh, you know, as in terms of ownership uh, um, is, uh, is not the right course. Uh, as Ambassador Gautier said, this is not a, this is not a non-rivalrous good. We need to deal with it in ways that respect um, uh, individual interests in that information, um, but to try to inject uh, notions uh, of Ownership, whether it's at the individual level or at the state level, um, you know, puts too much friction into the system. Innovation, creation, uh, all of the things that we've, we've talked about in terms of benefits of the digital economy do depend on information flows. We need to work together to enable those flows, uh, to enable those flows in ways uh, that respect uh, the the individual interests and other interests uh, uh, 
relating to that information. Um, you know, my name is an important part of, of my identity, but it is regulated uh, by the state. Uh, I don't have exclusive ownership of it. Um, and that is the way that information works. So, um, again, you know, we need to uh, you know, work uh, together based on common values uh, to enable information flows. Thanks very much, Cam, for this very rich uh, insights. Um, and it's it's true that what you you you, you talk about data localization as you know contradicting um, the digital economy, being in contradiction with it. And some say that maybe mm -hmm. the EU should more um, um, forcefully endorse free digital trade as the preferred global standard. But I also like how you say that the EU at least should be uh, given credit for. A take in action when so many others uh, have been missing in action when it comes to proposals for the digital economy. Um, now turning to uh, Lucinda Crichton, uh, joining us from Brussels, uh, reminding our audience that you're Chief Executive Officer of Vulcan Consulting, as well as Senior Advisor to the Counter Extremism Project. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm wondering if you have some thoughts on uh, you know, what is the EU trying to achieve with all these plans? And I know that there, you know, the data strategy, for instance, uh, proposes to create personal data spaces, you know, do individuals want those um, uh, data spaces? And, and to what extent does it make sense for governments to intervene uh, when it comes to data sharing? Uh, I know that uh, Annette emphasized the importance of cooperation with the private sector. Uh, to what extent does that work? Could you put your audio on, oh. please? I think you're mute. Ah, okay. No? Oh, no, you're here. Thank you. No? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so, thank you. I'm actually joining from Dublin uh, rather than Brussels uh, this afternoon. Uh, and thank you for, uh, for inviting me to uh, represent the Counter Extremism Project uh, in this discussion. Um, we are a transatlantic not-for-profit organization which uh, to a large extent um, focuses on transparency uh, in terms of uh, online uh, presence and uh, we have been focusing I suppose very closely on the uh, terrorist content online regulation and also the forthcoming Digital Services Act. So we're following all of these issues extremely closely and analysing the different um, approaches, not just in Europe, but globally um, to the, the threat of terrorist and extremist content online. Uh, so I think this is a really timely discussion because we really do have a plethora of proposals coming from a very active European Commission, uh, which is really anxious to deal with all sorts of issues um, from the, the terrorist threat to disinformation, misinformation online, uh, to the whole area of digital, uh, digital sovereignty um, and the transfer of data. Um, so it's, uh, I think as the other speakers have, have very eloquently pointed out, this is a really complex area which touches everybody's um, lives and touches every aspect of, of business now and trade globally. Um, so it's very difficult to look at it in a, in a siloed fashion. Um, I, I think one of the points um, that has been made is that um, the European Union has led uh, in terms of transparency uh, and tackling these very complex issues around data, uh, data protection, data transparency and uh, I think that's a very positive thing. Um, it's not to say that everything has been perfect. If you look at GDPR, um, I think it has been a, a, um, a, a stage setter, if you like, or a scene setter globally. Um, and while it was perhaps viewed with a lot of skepticism by large global um, tech giants, you know, they have embraced it. Um, they are making it work. Uh, and companies of all scales and sizes are making it work, um, but it's not without flaws and it, it will be reviewed in the lifetime of this commission and, uh, and it certainly can, can be improved. Uh, I think uh, one lesson from GDPR is that um, complexity sometimes can make um, the functioning of regulation of this sort uh, much more challenging and sim simplicity 
really is um, the, I think, the, the gold standard and the objective that we should be striving for. Um, so there are lessons to be learned from GDPR, which I think can be applied as the European uh, Union looks at its new data strategy, looks at its uh, forthcoming legislation on artificial intelligence, and um, of course, um, deals with the Digital Services Act. Um, uh, from, from our point of view, I think um, the real focus um, is not so much on who controls the data, whether it's governments, whether it's private industry, whether it's individuals, and to a large extent that horse has bolted. Uh, it's very difficult to, to sort of backtrack um, in terms of where data is held. Um, but I think what's key is transparency um, and uh, certainly in uh, the consultations which have already occurred around the Digital Services Act, and we'll see the, the publication of that new act hopefully in, in early December, uh, I think the focus has rightly been on, um, on ensuring that um, there is full transparency in terms of um, not just how data is managed, um, but also uh, transparency in terms of how um, data is used to target particularly consumers and also uh, how data is, is, um, is manipulated through algorithms. Uh, and at present there is virtually no regulation or understanding or transparency of that, not just in Europe but globally. Uh, and I think if we do want to open up a truly digital um, global environment, trading, commercial and otherwise, then um, you know, entirely new standards of transparency will be necessary. And uh, I think that type of transparency cannot just be left to private operators, um, but needs to be uh, en ensured and monitored by, um, by specifically designed agencies, government agencies, um, whatever format they take. Um, I think, you know, on other, other aspects of the discussion that we're having here, um, you know, I, I, I would share um, uh, particularly Cameron's view about some of the language being a bit, bit unfortunate. I think particularly in these times of COVID, you know, we are seeing more of a focus on nationalism, on sort of this emphasis on domestic champions, not just in the context of data, but in the context of uh, pharmaceutical goods, PPE, et cetera, globally. And, you know, the, the discussions we're, we're, we're having around supply chains. I think it's important that we don't close ourselves off, that we don't pitch ourselves as uh, competing entities, but rather find ways in which uh, at least um, friendly nations and allies can work together for greater transparency, uh, greater competition, greater innovation. And the European Union has wonderful tools at its disposal to, at its disposal to make that happen. Um, I think we have one of the leading uh, competition antitrust regimes in the world, and there's a huge amount that can be done to utilise that and to leverage it in order to ensure that we support competition as opposed to you know, a pursuing a path of protectionism, which I think would be a, a backwards and retrograde step. Thank you very much, Lucinda, and uh, thanks for bringing in that element of transparency and insisting on the international uh, element. Uh, I know that some suggest that we could do more pre-standardization in some of the approaches when it comes to data governance framework so that you'd avoid baking principles uh, too much already before we can actually sit around the table and agree uh, you know, to make things more interoperable, for instance, between the United States and, and the EU. Um, so uh, what I picked up from what you said is also, um, you know, more rules from, from the EU generally. There's really a push to become more of a regulatory superpower. Some believe that more rules and more certifications will enable more trust and more adoption of technology. I'd like to turn um, to, to bring you back in, Ambassador Verdier, uh, because some suggest that, you know, that might come at the expense of innovation and there's a lot of skepticism from various stakeholders that are expected to participate in the proposals of the commission like Gaia X because of the lack of uh, you know uh, capabilities the, the limited possibility to scale with those uh, alternatives and you know I know also the French government is planning to create a French Airbnb should we not stop betting on the wrong horses and try to go after areas where we can actually lead uh, when you look at the cloud landscape, uh, it's saturated. Uh, a lot of the providers are American. Mm -hmm. 
Could you please unmute yourself? Merci. <laughs> Sorry. So you know, I'm a former entrepreneur. I started three companies, uh, the last one in big data. So I understand your point, and maybe I give you the point. Uh, very briefly, but very seriously, and maybe I can exchange with uh, Cameron Carey, because you, you, were, you were a bit ironic about this old-fashioned world of sovereignty. We are not speaking about a continent of bureaucrats wanting to make rules and rules and rules. Uh, we are speaking about very concrete issues, if I may. Uh, for example, in the US election we are seeing now, the two candidates has a, a huge database of 200 million of citizens with 50 information about each to design personal advertising campaign with um, half a billion dollars each to make personal advertising. We don't want this in Europe. We don't organize our elections like this. And we want to protect the privacy and to regulate political advertising. We have the right to organize our continent like this. A second example, quite every application in your smartphone does use uh, Facebook Connect, PayPal, and Google Maps. Okay, so they have the right uh, if they choose. But it's dangerous for European economy uh, because uh, for example, Google, two years ago, decided in one day to change the API policy and to multiply the price by 100 in one night, like this. Uh, as a French CTO, I asked to my administrations to use OpenStreetMap because it's a more uh, secure strategy if you develop your service to develop this on, on a platform we cannot change the rules and the price like this. Mm -hmm. So we are speaking about very serious issues. We spoke a bit about terrorism content. Uh, for a long time, till the last, two years ago, uh, the US definition of terrorism didn't uh, integrate domestic terrorism and far-right extremism. We, and we did have to face the Christchurch attacks and things like this. So we cannot just wait for uh, regulation uh, coming from the US and Facebook uh, adapting just this regulation. We have to, to be able to sit on the table and to say, sorry, we want to fight against uh, far right terms. So that's the point. And, and we will make this. And as I said, we will make this because we will innovate, because we will regulate, because we will exchange, because we will create, uh, not just by one or two or three laws. And to conclude, so I give you the point, uh, Eileen, that I, I, saw, I, I say it very often that when someone say we'll make a XXX European, it will fail because in the digital economy, winner takes all, first take, takes all. So if you start the second after a big tech company, you will lose, you are too far. But so we have to innovate in a different way, not just copy, copying companies. From my, and I did predict, predict the failure of a lot of old industrial approach in Europe. From, from what I know, Gaia X is, is not the same because Gaia X feels something very digital. It's an, a huge interoperability system to be, to be sure that all um, European industrials will be able to share resources in a very efficient way. It smells good, and I, I hope that we are entering in a new uh, era where we have digital strategy to face digital issues. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, Annette, I'm sure you have a reaction. Um, with, you know, there's a lot to unpack with what we've heard, but particularly on GaiaX. I recently was in Germany and I was asking some people from the Ministry of Economic Affairs, what's going on? You know, what's the plan? Why should we believe in this project? Um, so we're, we're happy to see that they're developing something and doing something, but we are not 100% sure if, if this thing is needed there, um, if this is a thing that we should be focusing on. But we are keeping our eye on that, uh, how the de development process is going. And if we can be a help there, if we can consult them somehow. And, and we would be, again, I have to talk about the private sector view here, mm -hmm. um, because we, we do fully hope that uh, the private sector will be also able to, um, to, to focus on that uh, prospect there 
and then to actually also maybe maybe help to establish this project. But um, I have to be honest with you that we have some concerns because um, uh, the entire project has been led by only Germany and France. Um, so the question is, where are other countries uh, and why this is only managed by two uh, large states in the European Union? Um, because maybe they're going to get a power of this information, then they're going to manage all these kind of things from their side. Um, so um, I'm, I'm not saying that we're not supporting that. Uh, we are keeping the eye on that and, and whatever the European Union is doing, we are more than happy to negotiate all the things and, and to be uh, a big partner also on that side. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to turn to, to Carl again, uh, also commenting on this aspect of one of those aspects of the, the proposals of the Commission, so creating this cloud infrastructure. But there's also been uh, you know, some events in, uh, on other, when it comes to other topics like, or instruments like the EU-US Privacy Shield. Where do you think this, is, uh, this could be going um, moving forward as the EU and the US are you know, trying to negotiate? Well, it's very difficult for me to tell where this is going. I think some of us on the panel have more insight um, into that. What is clear is that there is um, a number of imbalances uh, between Europe uh, and the United States when it comes to technological leadership uh, right now. Uh, the US clearly has the edge in artificial intelligence and in um, developing digital technologies, but Europe arguably has the edge when it comes to regulation. And I think one thing that we are seeing um, increasingly in uh, the debate, which I think um, is the wrong way to think about the future uh, of the digital economy, is this notion that we need to have these um, large multinational tech giants in order to be competitive. Uh, so far, many of these tech firms have had very little impact on the real economy. Productivity growth in the United States has been in decline for 10 to 15 years now, despite all the hype surrounding digital and artificial intelligence. And the reason for that is that artificial intelligence is not yet a mature technology, and we need to stop talking about it as if it was one. What is needed for AI to become truly transformative is a lot more of innovation, especially to make artificial intelligence more data efficient. The notion that you're going to have a huge advantage in artificial intelligence, because it's sitting on a pile of data, is absolutely wrong. And, and what we see is actually that we have been biasing uh, developments in AI towards more data intensive uh, um, applications, such as classifying cats and dogs, such as playing video games. Those things are not going to have any tangible impact on the economy. One an analogy that I really like is that, you know, if you go back historically and you, as you look at the first industrial revolution, we're arguably in the fourth industrial revolution, uh, and I think some parallels um, with the first industrial revolution um, still carry. So the first steam engine developed by Thomas Newcomen had virtually no impact on productivity growth at all because it was extremely energy inefficient. It was really only with James Watt's separate condenser that the steam engine became energy efficient and began to have an impact on the economy. We need this, this separate condenser moment in artificial intelligence. Mm. And for that to happen, we need to leave entrepreneurs with a lot of freedoms and ability to experiment with different type of ideas. We need to get away from the idea that we need to support global technology champions. What we need to support is new businesses having new ideas and coming into the market. It used to be the case historically that when you had excess profits in the market, you would have businesses coming in and comp competing away those excess profits. That is no longer happening. And the reason for that is that there's a lot of rules and uh, uh, regulations that prevent that from happening. And many of these companies already have market power and can prevent that from happening. So what we do need is to foster competition in order to make sure that we harness the benefits of artificial intelligence. Uh, maintaining the status quo is not something that is going to 
either uh, give the US um, the advantage of actually having a transformation that impacts people's daily life in terms of raising living status, or trying to copy that approach in Europe is going to be equally um, unsuccessful. Uh, so I think we really need to think through intellectual property law, whether we can actually have technology companies pursuing patent blanket strategies to block competition rather than protecting products. I think the situation right now is completely unsustainable. And we really need to think about uh, antitrust uh, and competition policy uh, very carefully uh, to make sure that we have more competition. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Um, listen, um, do you do you agree with what Carl said with respect to you know the importance to foster competition and that the status quo wouldn't be acceptable? But how do we foster competition? When you you've probably heard of the, those leaks leak documents uh, from the Commission suggesting a list of uh, prohibited practices for what uh, the Commission calls uh, gatekeeping platforms. Do you think this is the way that uh, the EU should? Uh, should use uh, moving forward in the digital economy? Should they maybe not try to find a common ground with other countries when it comes to antitrust and competition policy or even uh, online content issues like disinformation? Well, I, I think disinformation is probably a difficult area for the European Commission um, DG competition to get involved in. Um, but I do think that DG Competition has the tools to, to, to deliver a, a more even and fair level playing field, which is what the whole um, purpose of compet competition law is in the first place. Um, and we have seen it, we've seen it done by the European Commission in, in the last 10, 15 years, um, where it has, you know, challenged the monopolization of, of data and the exclusion of competitors from certain platforms. Um, and it has done so quite effectively. So I think that the European Commission has pretty robust powers and capacity to, um, to you know, strive to ensure that, um, that a level playing field is achieved. Um, and I think that that is something that is both desirable and, uh, and practical. Um, you know, I, I do think that it's fair to say that, you know, we have lagged quite a, quite a way behind the United States in particular in innovation in, in technology. Um, and I think um, some of the points that Carl has made are really interesting in terms of, you know, the fact that it's not simply about the, the, the scale of data, but actually about innovation in terms of how that data is utilized. Um, and that's where I think there is a real opportunity and a real gap uh, in Europe for innovation um, and for, um, I suppose, lateral thinking in terms of how we approach that. Um, and that can be achieved in, in many respects through R&D, through supports, through different schemes. And we see a lot of that already happening and being channeled through, um, through the European Union and uh, individual member states too. Uh, also, tax policy is is a, an obvious way in which um, um, innovation can be supported and encouraged. Um, you know, innovative thinking around capital gains tax and so on can support uh, startups and 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 also uh, encourage um, those startups not to um, uh, be sold or acquired at an early stage if they're showing high potential. I think it's important, and I'm I'm sh I, I certainly know that one of the one of the objectives of Europe's industrial strategy is try to ensure that um, more of those European um, high potential startups, unicorns actually stay in European ownership um, and are not um, are not flipped or sold at the very, very early stages. And that's something that can be supported through smart government policy at member state level as well as through um, EU strategies. So I think there's a lot um, in our toolkit um, and a lot that can be achieved um, without sort of, um, I suppose, going down the road of the kind of protectionism which others on the panel have warned against. Uh, um, and, it, I, you know, I, I would bring the point back to transparency. I think um, if consumers and if um, business is to have confidence in the system, 
um, and you know get behind and support a European digital strategy or data strategy, uh, then it has to be based on foundations which are really, really clear in terms of the um, the requirements uh, around transparency. I think that is the biggest risk to the sharing of data globally at the moment. Um, there are security risks related to it, obviously, um, but there are just confidence um, issues which accompany that. And I think that that is something, um, it is an area where the European Union, uh, above any of our competitors, definitely has an advantage uh, and a track record. And it's something that is to be built upon. Thank you very much, Jacinda. Uh, we have very little time left, but uh, we have a question from the audience from Katarina Schwertnerova. Sorry. Uh, I think this is a question that uh, Cam Carey could uh, respond to. So let me read it to you. Where do you see the trend of incorporating data flows clauses into the international trade agreements? Do you think the amount of data generated by citizens may become a competitive advantage of some states, which will then naturally become more interesting for trade partners at the expense of others? Are you comfortable with this question? Um, so I don't think uh, that, that uh, trade uh, agreements are uh, the best vehicle for addressing uh, the flows of personal information. Um, I think the, the issues are simply uh, too fraught uh, to deal with them as, uh, as fundamentally economic issues. They obviously have economic impacts, um, but you know, I think uh, the, the experience of uh, discussing the transatlantic trade and investment partnership, uh, um, some of the uh, adapters, uh, uh, I think uh, shows the di difficulty of that. I think we are better off, um, certainly on a uh, transatlantic basis, dealing with that through the discussions that take place in, uh, you know, between the U.S. and the European Union as to whatever uh, replaces uh, the privacy shield. Uh, those will be difficult, but uh, I think there are pathways uh, well, on both sides, and it will take accommodation on both sides. Yeah, some some say that because, and thank you for addressing the U.S. Uh, EU privacy shield. Some say that the, the solution could lie in, in trustees uh, from the European Union. Um, you know, uh, trustees that could process the, the data on behalf of U.S. companies. Do you see any other solutions? Encryption, maybe. Um, well, I think encryption is certainly an, an important one. Um, it's you know, widely used by some of the the, you know, the larger uh, providers, um, uh, and you know, I think uh, ultimately uh, it will take I think legislation on uh, the U.S. side. I think it's difficult to resolve some of the issues uh, of judicial remedies uh, because some of the challenges there are. Uh, based in our constitution. So dealing with that is like asking the EU to change the charter to accommodate. But I think uh, you know, based on, on the ways uh, that, that uh, both the US and uh, uh, the European Union provide uh, uh, remedies uh, for, for surveillance that are uh, are are limited uh, because of you know, the recognition um, uh, in the Court of Human Rights as well as the the Court of Justice that you know some secrecy is is required so that you know real time remedies uh, are not always possible but I think subsequent notification um, could provide a basis for people to seek a remedy in U.S. courts uh, um, much as takes, you know, can happen um, in the EU. I think also uh, the codification uh, into law of, the, you know, the many uh, regulations and procedures that exist to provide safeguards uh, for uh, U.S. Uh, surveillance and, uh, that limit the scope uh, and the, acts, the scope of the collection, uh, the access to the information, I think would go a long way 
uh, towards changing the discussion. Thank you very much. It's very unfortunate that uh, I already have to wrap up this session. But thank you so much for, for your time and for being here to discuss this today. Um, and also thank you to our audience for tuning in or joining in person. Let's give a round of applause to our fantastic speakers, please. Thank you so much. And for those of you in this room, you can stay seated. We will continue uh, on this stage with the live stream of the interview with Svetlana uh, Tsikhanovskaya. Uh, thank you so much.